Wellspring Church of All Nations presents Screams in the Desert, hosted by Pastors George and Sharon Stokes. dynamic Las Vegas couple bring the life-changing Word of God alive through anointed prophetic ministry. Their teaching causes mountain-moving faith to bring the victory of God's love to bear on the everyday issues of life. Join George and Sharon now as they share with you the secrets and joys of a fulfilling, abundant, spirit-filled, and spirit-led life. Oh, hallelujah. Well, Dare Any of You is the title of my sermon tonight. It's uh, uh, comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. And I'll read that out of the Amplified Bible. Does any of you dare, or dare any of you in the King James, but does any of you dare in the Amplified when he has a matter of complaint against another brother to go to law before unrighteous men men neither upright nor right with God, laying it before them instead of before the saints, the people of God. The church ought to be able to take care of its own business. Wouldn't it? Shouldn't it? It should. And, uh, you know, we're told that we should actually take the least esteemed in our number and they judge matters when there's a real problem between saints. One of the most distressing things for me is what I've seen in the body of Christ is people are so crazy, just like the world. And uh, there's one one minister that, I, or so you know that he's called. And uh, I remember he he went to work for another minister who had a tremendous reputation, was doing a tremendous work of God, and uh, he went to work for him as an associate. He didn't like. Uh, the way he was being treated, uh, which is was normal for him. He didn't like the way he was treated anywhere he went. And so he sued the man. What? He, did, he, su <laughs> he sued his pastor because, you know, his pastor didn't treat him right, didn't pay him enough, and yakety, 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 yakety. And, and the, the, what really disturbed me was people that I, I had a fairly high re a regard for up until then told him that he was right. And I wondered, where your Holy Ghost is not working. Where is your discerning of spirits on this one? This is just, do, do you even know the Bible? And, and that, to me, that's really distressing. The justification is always the same. Well, if they were real believers, uh, I wouldn't sue them. But, I mean, I, I have heard that uh, way too often. There, there's always a list of, of wrongs done and, and more justification of why their particular uh, lawsuit is justifiable, right? It's crazy. It's crazy, like, like so many other things that are going on. They're not, they're not biblical. They're not righteous. They're not godly. They're just, you know, the church needs to come back and get a grip on who they are and how God wants them to treat each other and, and uh, uh, be toward each other. I mean, surely, if we have the mind of Christ, we can find three people in the body of Christ that can mediate and help us out when we really get locked up. But there doesn't seem to be too many, or at least they don't call on the right people. Anyway, what, what happened to Jesus' admonition to yield the one who despitefully uses you? I don't, I don't know where that went. Matthew chapter 5, verse 40 through 44, amplified. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your undershirt, your tunic, let him have your coat also. And if anyone forces you to go a mile, go with him too. Give to him who keeps on begging from you and do not turn away from him who would borrow at interest from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
It's just that there's, man, that sounds crazy, doesn't it? That's insane. But it's what God says. It's the way we're supposed to be. We don't have to like the way we're supposed to be. We just really should consider that God knows what he's doing and that he has a plan to work these kind of things out. Right? And he can if, if we can just possibly yield to it. I was in business for years before I was saved and for several years uh, after I received Christ I, I was still in business and during that time that I was born again there were a lot of occasions that warranted a lawsuit to recover the cost of labor and material not paid for. And uh, in some cases, uh, you know, we had liens on property and that kind of thing. But the, the, the idea of suing, uh, especially this, I'll never forget this one guy, and he said he was a Christian. He would call me brother. He went to church. I won't say which one. And uh, he just, right? And man, he hung me out to dry. I mean, hung me out to dry. In fact, most of the people that did not pay their bills were Christians, unfortunately. And uh, that, that brings a reproach to the cause of Christ, I believe, and to the name of Christ, but that being as it may. So, you know, once I was a Christian, I just couldn't in good, stand, in good conscience sue a brother. And so we just forgot it. Just forgot it. Yeah. And I'm not saying that I just instantly forgot it. I, I ground on it for a while, <laughs> right? And uh, uh, had to let God deal with my heart and, and move me into this place where I could just <laughs> let it go and forgive the guy, right? Well, the interesting thing is that, uh, because, I mean, who am I to really make a determination on who is a real brother or not, right? They could just be little baby pooping their pants brothers, or they could be mature brothers. I don't know, but, you know, it, it, this was kind of smelly. Anyway, it just, that's the way it was. And if they said they were saved, I just figured, well, they're saved. Yeah, they, they must be. I mean, whether they act like it or not, uh, God certainly wasn't done with me yet, so he probably not done with them yet. And anyway, so we, we moved on. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, Amplified Bible. But brother goes to law against brother, and that before Gentile judges who are unbelievers without faith or trust in the gospel of Christ. Uh, why? The very fact of your having lawsuits with one another is at, at all is a, is a defect, a, a defeat, an evidence of... Uh, perceived moral loss for you. Why not rather let yourself suffer wrong and be deprived of what is your due? Why not rather be cheated, defrauded, and robbed? Why not, you know, this, the gospel is just doesn't make a lot of sense to the natural mind, does it? It just doesn't seem right. But then the mind of man is at enmity with God, and so we really don't understand God's ways, do we? Uh, he's got something up his sleeve, obviously, which is, I believe, to tear us loose from possessing things that he ultimately owns all of. And to get us to a place to where we understand that all of our need is going to be met according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, and that if someone wants to defraud us or steal from us, He'll take care of it because he's the only righteous judge. And what, what I learned along the way was that someone takes from you by fraud or thievery, the Lord will make him pay it back. He'll make the devil pay it back. And I think once the devil figures out that you know, then he'll leave you alone <laughs> because it's pretty costly for him. Huh? In uh, Exodus 22.1, it, it, even back in the law, it said, If a man steals an ox or a sheep and kills or sells it, he shall pay five oxen for an ox, four sheep for a sheep. I think it's pretty foolish to put yourself in that position to steal one ox and have it cost you the cost of five or four 
And in, in verse 4, Exodus 22, if the beast which is stole is found in his possession alive, whether it's an ox or an ass or sheep, he shall be restored double. So even if you catch him quick, there's a return on your investment. You almost ought to put a sign out, please come steal from me. Please come cheat me. I'm not trying to be silly. This is serious stuff. So in, in uh, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 30 through 31, it says, Men do not dis despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he's hungry. But if he is found out, he must restore seven times. And who's the thief? Yeah, it is. It's the devil. He came for to steal, to kill, to destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So there's a, there's a negation to what the devil does if we'll just stay in Christ. If he's found out, he must restore seven times what he stole. He must give the whole substance of his house, if necessary, to meet the fine. In other words, everything is going to cost him everything. You get, I, I understand. You can say, well, in real life, this is, this, this is just not going to work. I beg to differ. <coughs> in Joel 2.25, it says, I will restore or replace for you the years the locust has eaten, the hopping locust, the stripping locust, the crawling locust, my great army, which I send among you. I don't want to go off on that. But the thing that God is interested in is that you and I recognize him as the sovereign <laughs> owner of everything. We can't really lay claim to anything he has not given us. Hmm? There's a Zechariah, uh, Zechariah's principle, too, in, in Luke 19.8. He says, so then Zacchaeus, I should say Zacchaeus' principle... Then the Zacchaeus stood up and solemnly declared to the Lord, See, Lord, the half of my goods now I give by way of restoration to the poor. He, he was a tax collector. He was a, he was a deceiver. He was deceptive. He stole from people. He really wasn't all that great a guy. And anyway, little Zacchaeus, you know, <laughs> climbed up the tree. Uh, and uh, anyway, met Jesus and had a complete change of character, of nature, of, of heart. And so he was willing to give half of what he owned he'd accumulated and he said and if i've if i've cheated anyone out of anything i'm going to restore four times as much god's principle is that what is stolen from you will be returned seven times or at the very least if it's by deception four times wow praise the lord hallelujah yeah, and if you're slandered, the Lord will vindicate you. Man, I certainly found that out. When we moved out here on this property, I mean, everybody took the best shot they could. It was unbelievable, but God took care of it all. He took care of it. But there again, that didn't happen in me just overnight. I mean, I got plain old aggravated and upset and everything I shouldn't have been until I just got together with God and rested it in his hands. It was his case. And I had to forgive. I didn't want to forgive. But that's the call of God. That's what he asked for. And so that's what had to happen. And to be nice and bless those that curse you, I, it, you know, it's, it, it takes a little doing. At least it did for me. Maybe it's easier for you. But, but what, whatever the case, God has promised to make your wrongs right. You... you I mean, we, we have to turn from our natural way of thinking, our natural way of doing things, and just get into his word and, and rest in him. And then all of a sudden, everything begins to straighten out, to work out. And really, forgiveness is the key that releases the provision of God. In, in Luke eleven four, it says, And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Well, there's the condition. We're forgiven when we forgive. <laughs> Who
who has offended or done us wrong, and bring us not into temptation, but rescue us from the evil or the evil one. In Matthew chapter 18, the 23rd through the 35th verse, there's a story, parable, whatever. It's very interesting to me. And it goes like this. Therefore, the king, kingdom of heaven is like a human king who wished to settle accounts with his attendants. Isn't that what Jesus wants? Isn't that what God wants to do with you and I? He wants to settle accounts with us, doesn't he? The only way he could do that is in Christ. And Christ gave everything, yielded everything for us. Keep that in mind. I know you know that. I'm preaching to the choir here. But anyway, when he began accounting, one was brought to him who owed about 10,000 talents. And the Amplified says that's probably about $10 million. Well, that, that's a pretty hefty debt, isn't it? <laughs> you add a few zeros, you can get real passionate about not being <laughs> taken, right? <laughs> take 10 bucks, well, okay, but take 10 million, that's a, wow, okay. Anyway, and because he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and everything he possessed, right? Didn't, under the law, the thief, everything he owned, everything, he had to, whatever it was, had to be turned over because of what he did so that the payment could be made. So the, the attendant fell on his knees, begging him, have patience with me, I will pay you everything. His master's heart was moved with compassion, and he released him and forgave him, canceling the debt. Now there's no way we can repay the grace that's been given us. That would be a long stretch. But it's the grace of our Lord and Savior. It's the grace of our God that released us and forgave us everything. But the same attendant, as he went out, found one of his fellow attendants who owed him a hundred denarii, about 20 bucks, and he, he caught him by the, the throat and said, pay what you owe. So his fellow attendant fell down, begged him earnestly, give me time, I will pay you all. He, he had the same plea. He was asking for the same grace, for a lot less money. But he was unwilling, and he went out and had him put in prison till he should pay the debt. So when this fellow attendants, everybody else is looking on, saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and they told everything that had taken place to their master. Now, we don't need anybody to tell on us to the master, because the master already knows even our thoughts even before we are quite aware that we're thinking them. He knows what we're doing, but he knows. A and Jesus was teaching this to get through to us, the importance of our having been forgiven, being a forgiver, and how great the cost that was forgiven us, how great the price that was paid, and how little it is for us really to forgive others. Then the master called him and said to him, you contemptible and wicked attendant, I forgave and canceled all that great debt of yours because you begged me to. And you should not, and should you not have had pity and mercy on your fellow attendant as I had pity and mercy on you? That's a good question. But that's, that's the bottom line of it, isn't it? Can we extend what we've received And in wrath, his master turned him over to the torturers or the tormentors or the jailers till he should pay all that he owed. I've, I've heard some uh, preachers say that the tormentors and the torturers, that's the demons. I don't think being turned over to demons would be very good uh, until you learn, but who knows. Anyway, so also my heavenly Father will deal with every one of you if you do not freely forgive your brother from your heart his offenses. Oh, so it is that way. So it is with your heavenly Father. <coughs> to be turned over to the tormentor. 
You say, well, that, that's pretty cruel. That doesn't sound like a loving God. No, but he's a just God. And his greatest desire is to turn us from our folly, to mature us to where we're fit for heaven because that's where we're going. Our whole life is a learning process to bring us to a place to where we're fit for heaven. If we do it easily, willingly, we can have the time of our lives down here, but if we're always resisting and we're always, you know, how, how far can I push God? It can get real unpleasant. And it, that is just. It may not seem fair, like by today's standards, but it is quite just. But here we have a perfect type of forgiveness that the Lord has shown us. Should we not extend the same to the rest of his children? I mean, I had, I had a real problem with one guy. I mean, I, was, I wrestled with it, and I, I, would, I chose to forgive, and I prayed to forgive, and I believed I'd forgiven until I'd hear his name. Oh, man. Whoo, wow, you know, and, and then, it, then it just, it got down to some practical things, and I just, I really, really had to wrestle through it. But thank God, I'm glad to say I finally got through it. Because there's not a choice. You forgive, or you can't be forgiven. Now, that's, I know that's not what the hyper-grace people say, and it's not what we'd like to believe, but it's Bible as far as I can see. Now, our experience should never contradict the Bible, but our experience can kind of confirm the Bible, the biblical principle. And here's my experience. There's a Christian businessman, Bill was his name, and I, that's all you need to know, and he went to another church, and he defaulted on his debt, he was one of many, but he was the Christian brother. He always let me know he was a Christian brother. And uh, he just you know, he just walked off owing us a lot of money at a time that was really, really difficult for us. But somehow I had managed to get this principle hammered into my head, and we just, again... We wrestled with it. Mom and I just, this ain't fair. It ain't right. But God, if this is what you say, all right. All right. Let him go. Let him go. And off he went, driving his new car, which really upset us. Because <laughs> it was our money paid for it. You know what I'm saying. So anyway, you wrestle through that. You get through that. You forgive it. You really do. And you're just going through life. Life is wonderful. Life is good. And all of a sudden, one day, years later, I'm in the ministry now. I'm not in business anymore. And I, the phone rings. And on the other end of the line, hi, George, this is <laughs> Bill so-and-so. I go to such and such a church now, and I'm born again. I got born again. He said, I don't have any money. But, through all the legal proceedings, there's a certain amount of money that wound up in the county coffer, you know, from liens and this, that, and the other thing. He said, if you'll go down there, you'll at least get a portion of it. He said, that's the least I can do. Could have picked me up off the floor. We'd forgotten about it. We'd forgiven it. And here it is. I mean, it wasn't all of it, but it was just this... This is what happens. And, and God took care of, really has taken care of us ever since. We've never really lacked for anything by living this kind of life. And uh, it wasn't too long after that. I just, you know, the business just wasn't, it was too much work for not enough money. It really wasn't what I had dreamed of and wanted to. So I wanted to sell the business. We had decided to sell the business. We were going to go into full-time ministry. I really felt called to go into full-time ministry. The business really wasn't doing what I'd wanted it to do. But anyway, so, but I mean, hmm. so I'm praying. She, Mama's praying. I'm praying. We prayed that the Lord would send us a buyer. 
and really funny. And so I'm standing at the counter of the business, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking care of some customers, and this guy from a competitor, a salesman, actually, from one of the competing companies, he comes in and he says, hey, George, you want to sell your business? I said, are you serious? He says, I am serious. Do you want to sell your business? I said, yes, I do. How'd you know? He says, well, I just thought I'd ask because my boss asked me to ask you. I said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. And we negotiated, and they did. <laughs> I think that took care of Bill Jim. and everything else, because we needed out. We, we, our hearts were somewhere else. Our hearts were, you know, in the ministry. Our hearts were, I mean, we'd had our little business fling. That was it. Can you imagine that? And I don't know about you, but I've got to just look back and say, you know, just because, even as a young Christian, which I was then, understanding the biblical principle, it opened up God's favor. It, it, it allowed me to receive what only God could do. We hadn't advertised the business. We hadn't told anybody we wanted to sell it. I mean, it was just a... It was... It, I, you could have knocked me down with a feather, too, that time. Here I am. I got all these people here, and this guy, he's this salesman. And I'm thinking, I wish he'd go away, because I know he's a salesman. He's got nothing I want to buy at all. And he, he, besides that, he was a real pain in the neck. We both belonged to a certain men's group that I had quit because I was a Christian, couldn't belong to it anymore. And he was, he was one of the guys that always would harp at me about how I should go back, you know. And uh, so I, I wasn't all that happy to see him, but there he was, big grin on his face. Hey, George, you want to sell your business? <laughs> God has the final say on everything, and he will never let you come out as the tail. He said he's made you the head and not the tail, the lender and not the borrower. Not only is it the Word of God, but it's been my experience over and over and over again. I just submit to you tonight, the Lord can be trusted even when obeying Him scares the liver right out of you. Just go ahead and obey Him and enjoy the miracles that will flow in your life. Amen and amen. amen. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that even though it just, wow, it challenges us. When we yield, thy word is truth. And you watch over your word to perform it. And there's no weapon formed against us that will ever prosper. And I thank you for that. And I praise you for that. And Lord, I ask you to just bless your people with a, just a love for your word like they've never had before as we move on into this very, very challenging and exciting year. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Join us for services at Wellspring Church of All Nations, a dynamic church that lifts up the name of Jesus. We are meeting at 4870 Janelle Drive, located between Buffalo and Durango, with an entrance at 8140 West Lone Mountain Road. Our focus is to win the lost, connect them to Jesus and His church, train them in the Word of God, and help them find their place in the work of the Lord. Our service times are 10.45 a.m. and 6 p.m. on Sunday and 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-631-5027. That's 631-5027. Or you can visit our website, www.wellspringministries.com.